example, with my own children. But also, it's a two-way process. You know, it's good to listen to them, and it's also good, good for them to hear from us. So I'm very, very much happy about this forum that Jeff put together. And uh, I think we're going to learn a lot by listening and, you know, sharing and listening and learning. And I'm here to learn, you know, from the young people and from the other parents, because I think it's a challenging place to be as immigrants. And uh, we'll be talking more about that. Um, but I'm happy to be here and I'm willing to listen and to learn and also to share whatever little that I have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Motonya. You're welcome to the forum. Uh, the next person is Shiro. Shiro from um, the Korea Mites Betalize. You're welcome, Shiro. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Shiro Karanja from Korea Mites Better Lives. Um, I'm here with some of my team members. Can you introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Sherry from Korea Mites Better Lives as well. Mm -hmm. And welcome. Uh, yeah, and I'm also here. Uh, my name is Bogo. Yep, and we're excited to be able to discuss about um, what's going on right now and um, just give our perspective as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Grimides, uh, Shiro with your group. God bless you so much. And uh, last we have Brian. Brian, you're welcome. We also have Dennis. Yeah, Dennis. Ah, uh, Dennis. Dennis. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Dennis. <clears throat> uh, I'm a senior to be at Hazel Central next year. I'm 17, and I'm happy to be part of this forum and hope to learn more from each one of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dennis. I have not written your name down here, so thank you. I have already included your name. Uh, do you have Brian with us? I think is, uh, I'm going to check. He was he had the problem with like, logging in. So yeah, we can continue if he if he comes in. I'll let okay. you know. Oh, that's great. That's great. So um, I would like to welcome each and every one of us in the in the forum today. And without wasting questions, I would, uh, without wasting any time, I would like us to go direct to our, our questions today. And my first question goes to uh, Rose and uh, Arinora. Uh, because they have experience as parents uh, raising children uh, in America, uh, my question is, what are the biggest challenges uh, that you face or facing uh, or while raising children in America? Uh, I can give you uh, the opportunity, Rose, please, you can start uh, for us. And then uh, Arinora should join me later. What are the challenges that uh, usually are the goal uh, when you are raising children in America? or the biggest challenge, that should be the biggest challenge that you should go, other go. Uh, as a parent, especially who have raised teenage kids, which right now I have two past teenage, I can say trying to balance our culture, which is mostly the African culture and the American culture with our kids. That's to me feels like it's the biggest challenge that I've been trying to cope with because most of the time, I don't know American culture. I only do it, for, uh, if I can say, for work. And most of the things over here, as a parent and at the time I came over here, I don't think I can switch to the American culture at any one time. That's not going to happen. But for my kids, they're kind of as a sandwich in between the American culture, which they are very much in it, and they have dived in it so much. But on the other side, when they get home, I want them to behave like African kids. So what we do as parents, we put our kids in too much stress because this kid for the longest time of the day, they've been in school with the American culture, language and everything and the behaviors. But when they get home after four o'clock, for the four hours I will have to be with them or the five or six hours I'll be with them, I want them to behave like an African kid. They kind of get mixed up. And that's why sometimes we tend to judge them in a way. They're not hearing you. 
they might be saying things which might be sounding rude to an African parent, which is not. Like, if I can say, like, my daughter, she's 25, happens to move out from my house. That one in an African culture, unless she's getting married, seems to be the hardest thing in our lives. It took us time to agree with that, to admit that she's moving, and that is after graduating from college. She had her plans, but at 21, you are still taking her as a kid. She has done her own research, because after college, she had done research of where to get better jobs. <laughs> Missouri being a health state, my daughter had done accounting, and Missouri, it's not a business state. So she had done enough research to know the business states which can allow her to get a job as she goes on doing her master's. But for us as parents, we were not getting her point at all. So this girl was decided. And we as parents, we had nothing to tell her. As the dad was here trying to see us if this girl is not following what his plans are, the girl had to stand on her position and say, hey guys, I'm moving and that's it. I know why I'm moving, but you'll come to understand it later. So it came to a point whereby we had to let go. But I think that was the hardest thing in our lives to see like, okay, this girl is making decisions and she don't feel like we are part of it. And as parents, I don't think we let our kids go even at 25. And if you flash back in Kenya, you can see kids who are still coming for food in their mother's kitchen even at 40, unless they're married. But here, a kid at 18, they have decisions. And I can assure you parents that the decisions these kids are making, let's not first judge. Let's listen, why is this happening? And most of the time I feel like if you give your kid her first bachelor's degree, they know what to do with their next. I'm not getting involved in their masters that much. Like pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. They get the bachelor's degree, that's the best. As a parent, up to that point, this girl or these kids, they open up their minds to other things. The best thing is to give guidance. Listen, that's the best advice I can say. Listening, why are they saying this? Why are they having these decisions? Because if I stand like an African parent, things are not gonna work and we're gonna get frustrated. But if you listen and then you get from what views they have of making the decisions they are having, that will be better. On the other side, I can say, Taking kids to college, it might be challenging and it's not an easy thing. I've taken two. My daughter has graduated from college in 2017 and now my son is graduating this year. We are starting 2020-21 from college. So I count it as a milestone, but it hasn't been easy. I won't lie to anybody. The parents with little kids or you've not taken kids to college, you get ready for some challenges. It's not easy. There is financial aid over there. There are scholarships over there. There's some tuition fees that you have to pay from pocket if kids do not qualify for financial aid, for any financial assistance, it's challenging. You see sometimes even though we take kids to college, you might think like it's a done deal. They just get to the first year. You think they're gonna go for four years without you digging into your pockets. No, that's not gonna happen. It's an issue of we sit down, we see the way forward. So if you get financial aid of these amounts and the whole school year fees is these amounts, what are we gonna do with the rest of it? I've seen, and personally I've seen parents who, when they go for college visits, they get to a point whereby you are told the school fees is like 20,000 or something. 
If I will lie to you, that amount in the ears of a Kenyan parent or an African parent is not a joke. Here we are talking about some millions of Kenyan shillings. And as parents, we are so good and very quick in transforming dollars to Kenyan shillings. So when you hear that you're gonna pay school fees for one year as two million, that's 20K. And I'm talking about the cheapest colleges that you can get. Yes. The parents tend to get away and they get it as a done deal with that kind of college. Maybe our kids are working too hard to get to a four year college, but whenever they fight for it, we get there and we feel like, okay, uh -uh, that's impossible. 20K, mm -mm, we're not doing that. Because you see all the impossibilities. It's always good for the upcoming college parents. Let's talk, let's reach out. How did you do it? How did you deal with this? Where did this 20K come from? Because right now, I'm about to get the second one to college. I can give advice. Don't just give up because you go there and you're told about that K. How do you go about coming up with this money? Because these kids, they know better how to work for financial assistance. They know how to work for scholarships. And if I can tell you, I won't lie to you, my second one will be getting out of college without college loans. How that happens is just a miracle. And I'm ready to fight even the third one with college loans. Because there is one belief that I have. I might be working very hard to build too much back in Kenya and make a future. Right now at my age and my husband's age, if you do the calculation of how long you have left to enjoy life, it's probably less than the years you've lived in this universe. But am I gonna deny my kids education in this country which has made me tolerate and at least get done with all the challenges in this country because I want them to have the better thing, the better education than they had in Kenya. Because if we look at the whole situation as Kenyan parents, we go through a lot over here just because of our kids. I can say most of us, we feel like we are doing better in Kenya and that's how most of the parents feel. But when we come over here, we have all these challenges and we wanna go through them because we believe that I'm doing it for my kids. But when I say I'm doing it for my kids, am I gonna get there to have them get the best education that they didn't have in Kenya? Or am I working too hard to make my future better or my kids better? When I'm building or I'm doing all these investments for my kids, why don't I invest in them instead of investing for them? If I invest in them, especially in education, I feel like I'll have done much more better than when I start investing for them. Because these kids, I'm not lying. I don't think they're gonna follow me when I go back to Kenya. I might leave them here. So if I'm doing too much in Kenya, just because I feel like I'm going back with them, I might be following the wrong path. So let's just focus on our kids and see the best thing. We talk with them, let's sit down, talk, see, what careers they have, what plans they have. Do we as parents sit down and even know the GPA of our parents? Do we sit down and know the classes our kids are taking? Right now, I can tell you, I have to go through my sons. He's in the fourth year in university. I don't care. I call the school, they won't give me any information about this kid because he's over 18. I'm paying the school fees, but they cannot tell me anything about him. So the rule is you sit down here, open that computer, we go through your grades. What are you doing? Your classes, what are you doing? Because the school will not allow me to. You are the one who knows I'm paying school fees, so you're gonna let me understand what you're doing in school. As my daughter, small one, going to second year of high school, how did she make it through the first year, even with the challenges that, that came up at the last minute? Do I know how she's going to the second year of her school or when she's going to the next grade? Do I know how she's going there? Or we are just saying, okay, a school year is done, let's keep going. Uh -uh. It should be, we sit down, let's see what you've been doing this year. 
If there is anything, I'll encourage the parents, do not miss any parent-teacher conferences. I've never missed one for my kids and our wounds. They don't tell me, emails will come. And guess what? I'll get permission from work because I have to attend. And I'll attend until the last one. So let's not, because we do get information from schools. Whether they want to tell us about it or not, we have the first-hand information. Let's just tell them, okay, tomorrow we are going for parent-teacher conference. They are not aware, they don't like it, but guess what? They don't have any control over that. But the most important thing to me, I feel it's like sitting down, talking about it, and let them know you are following. Let me not be a parent whereby I just say that my kid is in this year of college or is in this year of high school. Do I know which days that they miss school or not? Oh, mine is just to know, okay, they are especially the fathers. It's only knowing they are in fifth grade or sixth grade. That's it. Do you ever attend that school to know what your kid is doing? No. And these kids, they know how to learn our minds. If we happen to follow, especially with school works, they will know and they won't joke around. But if we are only parents who would be asking, okay, what is your next class? And then when they tell you sixth grade, by next week even you don't remember they will take advantage of such kind of issues. So let's just be at the tip of their lives, especially their education, which I've seen as a most challenging issue with everything. Otherwise, for now, that's what I can say about the challenges and what we've got to do about them. Thank you so much. That is too much. Yeah, that's good. Um, and I would like, uh, I'd like to hear from Arinora and hear what is the experience from her side in the fact that, that is so challenging and I believe you're getting something. And because we have the youth here and we have them, they are going to give us uh, uh, their insights and their story. Thank you so much, uh, Rose Jenga. We shall also come back to you with an, uh, another question. Arinora, sure. give your, give us, just give us your experience. Absolutely. Um, I would like to thank Rose. She spoke really well. And as a mother, I share a lot of the things she touched on. Uh, one thing I must say, like uh, for myself, for Rose, and for a lot of young people here, when they saw the video, I'm sure there was a deep sense of frustration and anger and resentment because we're dealing with one and then another one, Central Park, and then this one. And it, it probably has led a lot of us to our tipping point. And for me, as a mother of a black son, it's scary because even though we raise our children like Rose just shared and we try to help them navigate this life of, okay, you are African at home and you are American at school and, and trying to merge both lives, we still fear for them because when a police officer stops a black boy or a black man on the street, they don't know you are African. And I share that with, with my son and people that intern with me sometimes that we, we must have to work with them because you don't want to lose your life. And I talk to my son, we have this conversation almost every single day. Um, as a mother in America raising a black child, a black African child, I, I must tell you, it was difficult. I arrived in St. Louis just a little over 16 years ago. And uh, for me coming from London, because I was raised in London, born in Nigeria, we did things differently in London. You know, educational system was different. All the sport activities, we really didn't do. Summertime, you shut down until August. But when I got here, I had to learn quickly about this culture. I had to learn that, yes, I'm, I was coming from a country where I was a minority, but a minority in St. Louis was a bit different. People ask me a lot, oh, where are you from? I like your accent. And initially, it, it was awkward, and I wasn't sure whether I should be comfortable with that. But I knew I had a job to do, and I knew that a lot of these changes would have to come from me. And I have to see it as an opportunity to educate myself in this new society I'm in, how things are done, because I want to succeed here. I want my children to succeed. America is still a great place. So just touching a bit on what Rose said, Yes, we are angry. Yes, we are upset. We are frustrated. But all this energy, we must channel it to do good things. 
And I'm talking to a lot of young people right now. You know, get your parents to get involved. I know sometimes some of us don't have the luxury of nine to five. Some of our parents are raising us by themselves and they have to work and take extra shift. You can't fault them for, for that. They are trying their best to do the best they can. So you have to work with them. Where you feel like Rose said, parents need to engage more, encourage your parents. Don't hide things from them. They are your community. And I tell you, whether you are in elementary school or middle school or high school or even after college, we would experience different challenges. I'll give you a quick story. When my daughter um, was old enough to go to school, I enrolled her in a Catholic school. And because I've been having conversations with her, there was one day I was in the kitchen cooking. She said, Mom, how come I'm always asked to play the maid? I said, what do you mean you're asked to play the maid? She said, yeah, my friends always ask me to play the maid. I'm like, what does that mean? She said, well, other people get to change roles and play other people, but I'm always getting, because she was the only black child at the school. And to me, it was troubling because that's kind of how they begin to, young children, these kids were like four, five years old, but I didn't know where they got it from. So as a mother, I knew that I had to do something about it. The next day I went to the school, had a work with the principal, the teacher and the daycare assistant that, hey, I had an issue bringing my child here because she was the only black child. However, you assured me that you guys are fair and I gave you a chance. Well, I'm hearing this from my child, do something about it. Same with middle school. I'm sure all the children here have issues. What I say to my children is that, look, I would support you, but I don't encourage bad behavior. Teachers are there to teach you. They are there to educate you. Teachers are not supposed to be your friends. They are paid to teach you and that's it. All you, all you have is one year of your life with this teacher and you don't have to see them again. Because some teachers are difficult to get along with. Some teachers will go out of their way sometimes to frustrate you. My son had that in middle school. He had a bit of that in high school. But I kept reminding him, this is not forever. So you yourself as a young person, let's help us to work with you. Because I, I didn't do much schooling in America. I only came here and did my master's. I don't know what it feels like to go through bullying in high school and middle school and all those challenges that you guys have to fight. So I think for me and what has helped is that I've always encouraged my children, even at church, that guys, you must get involved. You must have these conversations even when it's not comfortable. You must encourage your community and support efforts like this. You know, we don't have all the answers, but we are open to learning. And one thing I, I, I must say is that right now, for a lot of you growing up in St. Louis, there is hope. Vintendo for Africa, I think, is the best thing that's ever happened to young children because you have opportunity to get engaged in the way that my son never did. You have the support of your community. You have people you can rely on, you have role model. And even for us as parents, we have these resources. Because for me, anytime that I'm, I'm having challenges or difficulty, the first person on my contact list is Jeff, or I call Zelipa, or I call my church, or I call my other mentors. Let's learn to use the resources around us. I'm going to give an advice that was given to me many years ago to parents who are listening right now was um, something a friend told me when I first got to St. Louis and I was having issue with my son's uh, uh, class teacher there. She said, Arinola, sometimes as black people, when they write to us and complain about our children and send us email, we are quick to pick up the phone because it's convenient. Uh -uh, what did he do? Uh, okay, okay, okay. Phone goes down, conversation ends. But that paper that they've written to you, via email or letter goes in your child's file. So learn to respond likewise. If the school writes to you or, or complain or have an issue with your child, don't pick up the phone and call them. Respond via email. Because that way your response also goes in the file. And that was an eye opener for me because up till then, 
when I get, oh, he didn't do this, or oh, they, they got into altercation or whatever, I'm like, okay, well, my son is not like that, and what happened, and try to get to the bottom of it. But she reminded me that when you pull that child's file, they would only see the school's version, not yours. So learn to protect your child and make sure that we're following through as much as we can. I know as black people, as immigrants here in America, it's, it's hard because all of us want the best for our children. But our children also want the best for themselves and we have to allow them to live their dreams and accomplish their own destiny. We can advise, we can guide, and we can always assure them that, look, no matter where you go in the world, mama is here for you, papa is here for you. And once your child have that assurance, I believe that, you know what, even if they make mistakes, they would come and talk to you about it, or they remember what you said to them. So that's kind of what I have to add for now, not to take too much time. Thank you so much, Eleonora. That's so that's so much uh, for us, and I think I, I think that you have very good experience. Both you and uh, Rose, you have a lot of experience, and we shall be coming back to you. And I would like us to hear from Dr. Mutonya about the experience that he has, uh, because he's also a parent besides being an educator. Uh, let us hear from Dr. Mutonya his experience on uh, raising children here in America. Well, thank, thank you. So and uh, I think the previous speakers, Rose and Arinola, have uh, touched on most of the major points that most of us go through. But just to reinforce a few that um, I think, speaking on what Arinola has said, is that we should be our best advocates for our children. I remember also somebody mentioning that to me, that um, we should show them that you have their back, you have their support, and they can always come back to you in case of anything. Because this is a harsh environment. We came to this country. Uh, we are not very familiar with the American way of life. I, speaking personally, I came. I didn't know much about the US. But here I was thrust as a graduate student, as a, as a father, and also doing other things. But I still trying to learn what the American way of life is. And at the same time, my son is still learning the same. He's going through school. He's maybe suffering the same challenges that I'm facing. Uh, there's racism. You can't hide it. There's racism in this country. And especially in middle school, I hear from my students, I hear from my sons, that sometimes that's the most challenging part of the American education system. For some reason, at that age, uh, children face a lot of push back out of discrimination and I think there's a lot of bullying going on. But for us as parents, one of the most challenging things is the fact that you want to shield your child from these harshness, from these harsh realities of the world. But then, uh, as others have said, I didn't go through this American system, education system, so I don't know it very well. So that to me as a parent, it pains me that I want to shield, to shield my child from this harshness, from this um, bullying, from the discrimination, from the racism. But then I don't have the skills, I don't have the tools. Maybe I even don't understand this system that well. But I think the best that we can do is just to assure our children that we, they have our support. We may not understand everything that they're going through, but we will be there for them at every point of the way. And I think the way I've, I've, I've learned about this is um, when I first came, uh, you know, the stresses, there's so many stresses in life here in, in the U.S. You're going through school, you have your stresses as a, as a graduate student, you have your stresses at work, and the child is also having his stresses, the community, the weather, you know, name it, almost everything. You go somewhere, somebody is calling you the N-word, um, you know, it feels so bad. But I think what I realized is just, um, just to sit back and do what my father used to do. Sometimes I used to ask my father, you know, when we were young, used to be my father and my, my father and mother, they have gone to heaven and uh, may they rest in peace. But I, sometimes I used to ask them when I had children, ask them, how did you manage to bring up nine boys and three girls, you know? Um, 
and at some point, why did you stop being so, why did you stop reprimanding us? And the best that you could do is just sit there and listen. My father told me something interesting and he said, well, I realized that when I listen, I learn. I learn what you're going through. I learn what your life is as a young person growing up in this new Kenya. And maybe it also gives me, gives you a lesson, a, um, a chance for you to listen to me. So in that kind of environment, I was able to listen to him, to his advice, to his teachings, to his guidance. And also he could also listen to me. And I think for him, he said it worked best. And I tried to take those examples, like I would sometimes sit my son down and say, you know, tell me what's, what's bothering you. And by opening up, I realized that uh, these are things I never talked to my father about, but I think we can even talk about dating, you know, when he's frustrated about uh, issues, even including dating, he can open up, you know. And I can tell him, well, I don't understand this the way we do it in Kenya. And I think by then I tried to impact the skills that I grew up knowing as a Kenyan man. And maybe through learning, I can also try to get that chance as a teaching moment to try to tell him about maybe how he can approach things the next time around. And I think this has worked well. You know, there are so many other things about um, challenges in school. You know, there are a professor or a teacher who doesn't seem to understand him well, or is very mean. And I think we talk about those kinds of things because I realized that if I don't talk to him, if I don't give him that ear, the world is not going to give, give him the ear, right? Nobody's going to listen to them. And I remember my very first time when we arrived, as I said, my, I have two, two boys. One of them was born in, here in the US and the other one arrived when he was about 12 years. The one who arrived when he was about 12 years, the first year, the, high, the middle school teacher called me about a week into, into school. And he said, well, your son has a problem. I said, okay, I think he has, uh, he has um, I think we should put him in a special education. I said, okay, why do you think so? He said, well, when I talk to him, he doesn't me look me straight in the eye. And every time he's talking, he's, uh, he's, he's just looking down or he doesn't, look me direct in the eye. And I said, oh, is that the problem? Yes. I said, do you know something? Where I come from, that's a sign of respect. You know, as children, we are taught not to look people in the position of authority direct in the eye like Americans do. He said, oh, is that so? Yeah, but why is he not even uh, participating, you know? I said, well, he's new. He just came from Kenya. There's a new environment. And I told him, well, I can show you this kid was in school in Mombasa in Nairobi and he was doing very well. You know, he was the top of his class and therefore, so, but, but what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is if I had followed what this teacher was saying, then I would have put my son in a very bad position. And at that point also the, the, um, the teacher learned something about African culture because he saw some, somebody who was not very exposed. So the point I'm making is this, well, we don't know about this. The children are also going through the same thing. We have to listen to them. And by listening, we learn a lot. And we can see what's happening in this, in this country. You can either, sometimes when, when they get to age 19, 16, 14, they're about as teenagers, there's a point that they get into rebellion. They want to question authority. And question authority, I don't know about you, but at that age, I also was questioning authority. I was questioning my family. I was also questioning the government. I got into trouble. And I think it's a natural thing. You know, it's a place where somebody is saying, I don't think you hear me. I don't think you appreciate me. I think you or I need to be heard. And I think there are two ways that we can go about it. You know, we can call in the National Guard or the vicious dogs. We can put the curfew, you know, or we can take the knee, as we have seen. We can use metaphors that are being used nowadays in, the, in this country. By taking the knee, I mean maybe getting to their positions and trying to understand what this child is going through. Okay. So there are those challenges. There are the challenges of we don't have the time because we are working so hard. 
to get our children a better life because we made, we made this choice to migrate for those who migrated. We could have stayed in the homeland, but we decided to come to this country to give our children a better life. But we made that choice and we made that choice because we want them to get the best that they can get out of this opportunity. So we have to work hard. We ha and by working hard, we don't have much time for them. And by not having time for them, they feel that we are burdening them. But it's all I should like. Well, I want to assure the young people who sometimes they feel that we are so lost and we are gone. It's out of love. We try. To, we want the very best for you, okay? And sometimes we all might also be going through some challenges as immigrants that maybe we don't want to share. We don't want to confess. Sometimes we don't want to share with, with everybody at home. But at this. We don't do it because we don't want to be there at home, but we do it because we are trying to get the best uh, for you and for the family. And finally, maybe let me put this other point that I've, um, you know, before I give others the chance, I want to hear more from the young people. Is um, there's a question of identity, identity, you know, and sometimes part of what bothers us is a question of identity crisis. Who are we? Who am I? Am I a Kenyan? Am I American? Am I a Kenyan American? Right? There's so many people define us in so many ways. When you come from Kenya, you're somebody of status. You're a Mwalimu, you're an engineer, you're a doctor, you're somebody, you, are, you have the reputation of, from your family. But when you get to the customs at the airport, all that is gone. Then you become an alien. I hate that word a lot, alien, you know? It's as if you don't belong in this earth, you're just something from outer space, right? but you're either a legal alien or some alien, right? If you're not an alien, you're a minority. If you're not a minority, you're foreign born. Maybe I do this because I'm a linguist and maybe language, I, I try to look at these things from a linguist point of view, but, but I think, and, some, and then when you look at the images, they saw the place that we come from, it's hunger, disease, death, and destruction. And some of those things sometimes, they try to define us. And I think what we should try to do as much as possible as parents and as, 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 as Kenyans, as Africans, is to try to change that narrative, to define ourselves, right? We should be proud of who we are, where we come from. And we, should, we come from a great continent with great people, the Mandelas, right? The Wangari Madais, the Chinua Achebes, you know, the great learners and all those people. So I, I think we should, Remember that we should not let others define us, but we should define ourselves. And I think as parents, and I try as much as possible to try to tell my children very much about family histories, the great people in our family, about the great culture in Kenya, the family values. And I think the more we talk about this, I think it gives us a foundation that when we're faced with racism or any other harsh realities in this world as an immigrant, I think we're able to withstand that. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot to talk about, but let me stop there. And uh, give thank you so much, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mutonya. We shall come back to you. We shall still come back to you. Uh, I think this discussion even could go even more, uh, uh, more time. It could even take more time. Uh, we can even uh, prepare it for another time so that at least we can exhaust uh, some of the information that you have uh, having such kind of experiences. But this time, I would like us to have some experiences from. Uh, the young people that usually have, uh, who have gone uh, through this system. I would like to hear from Sally and Dennis uh, before we go to the Korean Mites. And uh, Sally, are you there? Yes. Yeah, Sally, can you tell us uh, um, how do you handle having difficult and necessary, uh, but necessary conversation with the parents on issues having uh, to do with uh, uh, your life as a young person uh how do you handle yourself you know there are so many issues that you have been uh that usually affect you as a person um, uh, so to me i would say trying to speak to my parents mm -hmm. which i wouldn't say it's easy because i I've, I've come to learn like African parents or Kenyan parents, they have their own mindset and like the way we think. So like there's a lot of like struggle getting to like a common ground. Mm -hmm. So let's say if it's something like about school, like I know like in high school, like I had a very difficult time trying to communicate to my parents about like 
the ACT, like financial aid, because those were things that they were not aware of. And in some situation, I was just ended up forced into just like doing it by myself because it's easier than even trying to like explain the whole part of it. But to me, I would just say like, just for me, it was more trying to like give them up, like trying to teach it to them and like trying to like explain it to them. And like an advice that I would say to the parents is probably just letting, giving like, as people are saying, just giving your kids a, a platform that you're listening. So not just like, if I'm telling you about my struggle, don't just say, oh, I went through this struggle in Kenya because it feels like you're diminishing that struggle that I had. You might be, maybe your struggle was bigger, but like, let's say the struggle that I'm facing now, that would be like the struggle that I'm understanding and I might feel like it's bigger. So like one of the advices is just trying, like I've tried to like communicate with my parents, just showing, like give me that platform that you're listening and don't try to like, when I'm communicating, just saying your experiences without giving me the platform to explain what I was gonna explain. Mm -hmm. That's great. Dennis, what is the experience? Uh, I think my experience is pretty much similar to Sally's is trying to, you know, explain to them like our wants because sometimes their wants isn't the same as what we want. Because sometimes my like a Kenyan parent will say, I want you to be an engineer. I want you to fall this way. I want you to go to college close by and not far away. So I think it's like more talking about um, trying to listen, let them listen to you. Because I feel like parents, like Kenyan parents or immigrant parents, they don't, they try to have that Kenyan mentality of, oh, you should be a doctor. You should go to school this close by because it's cheaper. But I think if the parents will just like have that like sense of like, not a sense of, but just hear, hearing us out because um, it's our life at the end of the day because our parents aren't going to live forever. They all, they will one day pass on to go to heaven. But I feel like if they can have that sense of just letting us take control that we can, uh, having us take control for our own lives, it will help us to become uh, better people in society. Uh, now, uh, let me ask you, uh, Dennis, uh, do you have an opportunity to share with your parents issues concerning uh, adulthood, or maybe issue, issues concerning uh, how you should handle yourself as, a, as an adult? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because um, I always talk, we always talk about it every day, about how I should handle myself going out, making sure that I uh, represent myself. Because they always told me, once you leave the house, you're representing their, our family, our last name. So I think that's where I carry it everywhere. Everywhere I go, I make sure I carry my mom's and my dad's, I mean, my, my last name everywhere I go because at the end of the day, it's uh, whatever, my character is what they're going to see in my family's character. That's great. What about Sally? Sally? Oh, sorry about that. Oh, yeah, I would say the same thing, too. Yeah, so, like, as Dennis was saying, I've been taught, like, when I leave the house, I'm representing my family. So, yeah, I do try to carry my parents' like name and, like, my actions. That's great. I would like us to hear from the, the crib mates and their lives, and let us hear from Shiro. What, what is your uh, experience? Uh, Shiro, are you there? Yeah. So can you tell us what, what is the experience uh, uh, growing as a young person in this country and how have you been uh, going through having these uh, conversations with your parents and how have you been taking it when the parents usually direct you and what to do? Wait, I think there's someone else speaking, not me. It's oh yeah, yeah, Shiro. I'm talking um, to Shiro. Yeah. Actually, in, in, I would ask Boa to talk more so about his experience, but I think he'd probably give a better explanation. I, I think in terms of like um, referring to what Aranola had spoken about, about being black kids in America, that's kind of like the topic we're able to discuss on this platform. So I think before we say anything, um, if Boba is okay sharing with his experience before we go on. Yeah, uh, I can definitely share that. Um, so when it comes to like growing up here, the biggest struggles that I personally faced. Um, I came here when I was about 11 years old. So I went through the American school system from middle school, a little bit earlier than that. So from middle school all the way to high school. And uh, some of the biggest challenges that I faced were, uh, there was like the bullying, uh, 
based on my background. Uh, and it's important to for parents to understand that our kids here also face like a different sets of challenges. But before I get to that, um, this the challenges that I faced growing up here were uh, kind of being bullied, uh, but for uh, I guess the skin color that I have. Um, so that's something that I have personally faced. Uh, I remember it being uh, so bad to a point where um, I would not ride the school bus. I actually stay after to kind of like do different activities uh, mm. and then take a later bus uh, to kind of head home. Um, beyond that, uh, there are the challenges that I was facing you know, mostly had to do with uh, identity. And I know uh, the other kids have um, touched on this. There's always a struggle between, you know, am I Kenyan or am I American? You know, when you come home, you're Kenyan, but your entire day, you're pretty much in the American culture. You have to fit in within the American culture. So there's always this struggle that kids face of like trying to balance these two different identities. And I feel like that struggle um, makes it tough for our kids to truly know who they are. Uh, I think there's part of the parents um, trying to, and rightfully so, instill their tradition uh, of, you know, come from Kenya. Uh, we need to know our history, our languages. I speak both Kikuyu and Swahili still. So mm -hmm. I understand the importance of that. But then there's also the other side of it of when I go to school, I'm in an American culture. I have to thrive within the American culture. If you, um, I think every single parent that I, uh, that's on here, I'm pretty sure you all want your kids to be successful. And you want them to be successful uh, with, in this country and that's why you brought them to this country. But there's that understanding that needs to happen of to succeed within the country, you have to be able to navigate your way through the country. And in order for you to successfully navigate your way through the American country, you also need to be ingrained within the culture. So you, it would be hard for to expect our kids to succeed within the American culture, living from a Kenyan perspective. But it's also hard to completely say that we are 100% uh, American because I don't feel like I'm percent. Well, and, and by and by me saying I'm 100% American, I don't completely feel like I'm com I completely identify with uh, the American identity. Mm. So it's like a balance of Kenyan and of uh, American. And that's the biggest struggle that I've seen most, uh, that I have personally faced uh, growing up here. That and then being bullied uh, for my skin color. Uh, but the thing that I would say that uh, kind of drove me throughout the years was kind of knowing like I cannot perform people. So that's, that tended to be how I dealt with uh, that challenge of uh, skin color. Um, and I think I'll, I'll throw it back to Shiro and Sherry and see if they have to add on to that. Yeah, um, I guess I would say I I can't really say that there's an experience. I've personally gone through like bullying or anything like that, but I will give um, an experience I had when I lived in North Carolina. Um, I was driving home one day and um, I got stopped by a cop. And if anyone can see me, you can see that I have dreadlocks. So the cop assumed I was a guy and the cop stopped me and he stopped me and asked me, sir, are you, you know, is this your vehicle? Cause I had leased a car when I was leaving there. But um, later on when I gave him my license, he realized that I was a female. Um, he asked me if I could open my car just to see if I had anything illegal in it or anything like that and we were there for like maybe I want to say a good 30 minutes um that experience really like I think it didn't let it affect me 
But now that these are talk about race and um, our skin colors are a constant battle in this country, I think it was really, um, when I look back at that, I was like, wow, like, you know, my skin color really is an issue in this country. And I would, what I would say, um, adding to Boa's point, I think, and Arinola really framed it well, like at the end of the day, regardless of whether we are from Nigeria or Kenya, the American country sees us as black people. Um, your kids will be born into this, you know, if you have young kids who were born into this country and your kids' kids or grandchildren or whatever, they're gonna be black irrespective of their name, irrespective of their culture. And I think it's highly important, I would recommend to parents um, to educate yourself. Um, take this, whatever is happening right now in America, take it as a teaching lesson for yourself and for your family to completely educate yourself, excuse me, educate yourself in the history of this country, the history of black people. Because I think, like Bogwa said, right, rightfully so, our parents come here um, and you want your child to succeed. So your focus is on the success of the child. And then what they're left with to struggle on their own is their identity. Like, who am I in this world of being a Kenyan? And who am I in this world of being an American? And it's, 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 it's tough because I think there's no right or wrong answer to it. Like, you, there's no sort of like handbook that tells you this is how you need to handle the identity crisis that your child may be facing. But I would say in this, in this climate, it's highly important for parents to understand why the Black, I guess, the Black conversation and experience is so important to the child because they, they are going to grow up Black in this country. And, you know, for but what to say that he was bullied for his skin color, you know, we didn't have that in Kenya. You're, you're not really bullied back home for your color of their skin. So it's like a different sort of, sort of territory. Um, and even us as adults, just because we're adults, it doesn't mean, and we're young, it doesn't mean that we're not, we don't face racism. It doesn't mean that um, we're not also like trying to, to identify with who we are in this country. So I think it's, it's such a spectrum of a conversation, but what I would say is just, um, and I think we're gonna, we're gonna share some books here with you on the chat, um, some free PDF books that if you're a teenager, if you're a mom or dad, um, that you can read just to understand and then, you know, um, how you can even move forward for, for your family in that. Um, and I'll post that on the chat, but my thing, my main thing is just get educated and uh, I'll let my sister go ahead. Um, yeah, sorry, before you go, uh, kind of one point that I kind of wanted to uh, hit on was like the, and it's been touched on by a few different people, it's um, that uh, facing challenges here in America and understanding that your kids do have challenges. I think uh, something that I've come to kind of see and learn in life is no matter like where you move up to, you move from one set of challenges to a different set of challenges. So if you were to look at us um, as our parents who migrated here from Kenya to the States, um, just because you migrated to the States does not mean you do not have challenges. I think you have challenges that you face and you have to constantly deal with. And it's the same thing for the, kid, for, uh, the kids who are growing up here in the States. They're growing up dealing with a different set of challenges. Those, set, those challenges are completely different from what you dealt with, but at the end of the day, they're still dealing with uh, challenges that are very much real. And uh, it's something that you have to kind of like help them figure out how to navigate those challenges. But I, the thing I would say is do not dismiss their challenges for they are real to them. They might be different, but they are real to them. That, that's yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't think I have anything new to add on. I think everyone has like touched on the big points. Um, I would say for my own experience is that um, I think my relationship with my parents became better when they started to understand me as a child. And I always say that um, when there's an understanding between the two, it tends, I think from a child's perspective, I tend to, I started to listen to my parents more when they started to understand where I was coming from. 
you know, you kind of think of like a job and you have a supervisor and maybe, you know, like you want to tell them that you have a problem. If they, if they themselves give you that space and allow you and say, hey, if you have a problem, let me know, you're more likely to come and tell them the problem. But if they're always kind of like turning you away or they kind of in an authoritative state all the time, you fear telling them something. But it, it's always like as a parent, you know, you have to be the one to make the first move of like creating that space of, of um, being open to listen to them. So that's really what I would add on is that the, if, you, if you come with a willingness of listening um, and understanding, I think then you create a better dialogue with your child um, like for, for life, I guess. But um, that's what I would say. Thank you so much. We shall come back to you uh, as we shall be talking about racism in some, uh, that's why I had already uh, organized for you to give us more about uh, racism and your experience uh, according to what is happening right now in America. But for, uh, for our parents, I would like now to go back to Arinora and, um, and Ross Jega and ask you, how can we balance uh, being a parent and a friend to our children? Uh, so that at least we, we have had some part of the experiences and what they have really been undergone through and what they have been going through in this country as they grow, as they uh, go to school, as they interact with other people, uh, they usually experience a lot of uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. And that is true. How do you, uh, how that now do you become a, a better parent, a better friend to them as they try to uh, uh, excel in their career? I think one of the important things that we must do as parents is that we must listen to them. Uh, and it's not listen, you know, it's not to listen and dismiss them, but listen and understand things from their perspective. You know, our children's concerns are real, their fears are real, their experiences are real. And like uh, Cyrus said, uh, sometimes we want to shun off our children and say, ah, I, in London, do you know what I, go, I went through? I had to, you know, wait for the bus for, 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 for like 30 minutes in the cold and mommy didn't drop me to school and here I'm dropping you to school. You have a school bus and you're complaining, but they didn't experience what I went through, but they have their own experiences. And sometimes as parents, we want to protect our children and advise them. I learned many years ago that for a lot of our children, because we are so good at shielding them, they're not going to make the mistakes that we made. However, as children, they'll make their own mistake. And we should just allow them that room because that's how you grow. You fall, you get up, you keep going. And I'm going to encourage young people here that we don't have all the answers. That's why we're here. We're learning from you and we're making adjustments to how we parent. So bear with us, but we need that continued dialogue. And the protest is going to end. Protest is not going to go on forever. All the medias are going to go back to CNN and MSNBC and Fox News. But this conversation must continue. You must continue to engage us, engage your community, teach us what we need to do, how to do things. And also for the children, when we, from our experience standpoint, share things with you, don't dismiss us as old fashioned. And I experience it sometimes with my own children because you can see that, oh, that's not the best approach. But your heart is aching, like I wish you would listen, but sometimes they want to experience it and they want to learn from it. And as long as it's not something that would destroy their life. And my prayer for a lot of our children and for the ones online today is that I pray you don't make an experience that would cost you your future. Because there are some experiences that you can walk, mistakes that you cannot walk away from. But it's okay to, okay, well, I went to work late, I got told off, or, you know, I lost my McDonald's job, or it's, those ones are okay. But when it's like, a difference between getting involved with the wrong group and getting deported, that's a big one right there. So let us shield them, let us advise them, let us be open-minded. 
about our approach and just continue to learn. And we have fantastic resources in our community. Our children, they have their voice, they have the law that they can use. They have community like their church, Vintendo for Africa, and so many groups out there and so many mentors, even Rose. Rose has an organization where she's sharing her experiences with mothers and youth and helping that to enrich her community. Let's get engaged, let's encourage those people and continue to uh, do our best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Adinora. And Rose Jenga, what do you have to say about this? Rose Jenga? Yes. Uh, for me, I think the best thing so that we can get more information and have our kids open up for us, it's being their best friend. I do believe in our African culture, mostly we do practice the authoritarian kind of thing, especially in our houses, which it's what we've been brought up in. And we tend to catch up and move on with how we've been brought. But that's not working so far. And not only here, even in Kenya, with the current generation, Generation Z, that's not gonna work. So the best thing I can say is to make our kids our best friends. When we make them our best friends, they will come to us, share whatever they're going through, have some fun with them, share even the deepest things you cannot think of. So as parents, how can we give our kids even chances like Dr. Motonya was saying there, do they come to us to talk about their dating experiences? If not, why? At what age, for example, as parents, did we start dating? If we did it and when my kids get there, do I assume they're not dating just because it's not a talk which should not be in my house? No, it's a, dog. It's a, it's a talk which should be there. Let me know, okay, my son, you come here. I have seen some girls get in here. You are friends. But let me just pinpoint something and ask you, hi, happening, Nani? What can you do? Let's open these talks. Who among them is? When he goes out with girls, probably they're going for dinner or something. Let me just throw something because that's a mama's voice. Ah, and remember, those are not your sisters. But... Are we having these talks in details with our kids? When we open up and become their best friends, we'll see like we'll be covering even sex education with them, which to us mostly, the African parents, we mostly think like sex education is not a thing that we talk about with our kids. When are they gonna know? They know it. Let's not just assume they're holy joes we have in the house. They know all these things. But if it comes from a parent's perspective, you'll be in a position to tell them the do's and the don'ts. When I did this, I made this mistake. When I did this at this age, I did not achieve my dreams. So let's talk about it so that they can open up more. They come over to talk about the LGBT, issues and this is too much with our kids especially now the 15s and and younger if i talk about 15s and younger they come direct with a question which you have to look for answers but are we prepared as parents to talk about all these because it's happening when we come over now to see whatever is going in our country am i open to my son who is a black son and I won't hide it, I have a black son. Am I there for him so that he can know, yes, he's a black son, he gonna make it, he gonna meet his dreams if he still follows the paths. Despite whatever is going on through, let's teach them that their dreams are still there despite whatever is going through. Early this week, I happened to, but I'm not very sure whether we're gonna get there to raise it. I happened to do an interview with some three boys aged 21, 22, and 23. I did one with an African-American, I did one with a Kenyan, and I did one with a Nigerian. I just wanted to know their experience or the interaction they had when they was first pulled over. 
And if I can tell you from the three boys who did not know my questions, the information that I gathered from them is how they present themselves to the police. It's not the case because the first thing the police stops you or pulls you over may be because of your skin color or maybe an issue you had. But when they approach you, how do you present yourself? So that's something probably we need to talk to our sons, our black sons, of how to present themselves. Do they present with attitudes? Do they do as they are told? Are they kind of interacting with these police with the bitterness that we have that we are black and he gonna treat me like this and this and this? Let's teach them how to behave, how to respond. Even if things goes bad, because we cannot predict that, at least they won't be there to be blamed. Let's blame the wrongdoers, but let's teach them how to go about it. But how are we gonna get there? It's only by making them our friends, listening to them, and we still maintain the discipline in our house. Let them carry our names like the two highs, Dennis and Sally say. Most of the time they feel like they just wanna carry, okay, you want us to carry your names, and show everybody we come from a cool family? Yes, that's what it is. Because do you wanna go out there to show that you come from a bad family? Mm -mm. You are part of that family. Guess what? You have to contribute to the best of that family. So when we say they are going out there to carry the good name of that family, let it be, that's not gonna change. It has to be like that. Even me as a parent, when I go out there as your mother, I have to carry that name. I don't want to meet with Hiram over there. Then he looks at me and wonders, is that Mama Jeff? No, I want to carry my family's name wherever I go. So let our kids and parents, wherever we go, not only for kids, let's carry the best name of our families because that's very important. It's not an issue of failing, but let's carry our family values high as we can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Rose and Nora. I want to go to the group chat and uh, just uh, inform those people who are our participants from the other side. Uh, Shiro uh, has, uh, has written, parents know your children, listen, i.e. Uh, have active listening and taking action too. Please try not to judge them as they, the children, go through the things that sometimes they can't put in words. Um, let me, it's a long, it's a long. Uh, okay, she's trying to uh, encourage the parents to listen to their, to their, uh, to their children. Uh, so she says, uh, please try to, not to judge them as the children go through things that sometimes they cannot be able to put in words. Ask them if what they think about the matter and what they would have done to build and to help in critical thinking. That is uh, uh, Shiro who is saying that. And then um, there is a person by the name um, Geoffrey Sented is saying, when we share about our past dark moments, we are able to identify them better. So, as we, shall, as we shall be continuing, please just put some message on the chat and we shall be reading and activating uh, our discussion so that at least we can see how we can be able to help each other. Uh, I wanted us uh, to talk about uh, racial injustice, but that's a topic I wanted to be handled by uh, Shiro and her group. But before then, I would like us to come to the career uh, because we have really talked about the life and it's good now to talk about the how we can help our children and how we, we handle our children on issues uh, concerning the choosing of their career. And uh, I would like Dr. Mutonya to tell us how can we build and how can we equip our children with the necessary skills needed to handle the discrimination uh, and racism in America when they are choosing, or when they are choosing their career. Now, when, when, they come to, when they come to the university, or when they are choosing their career, how do we handle uh, the situation whereby we have really understood that they come from a different background, they are looked down upon sometimes, 
through uh, due to the color of their skin. But how do we help them? How do we equip them uh, to get the necessary skills uh, necessary for their lives? Dr. Mutonya, are you there, please? Uh, Dr. Mutonya, so if uh, the doctor is not there, uh, maybe we can try. Maybe oh, no, we can. In. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you so much, doctor. Uh, thank you so okay, much. Sorry, sorry. I, I think you have had my question, please. Yes, I did. I think I. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Yes, before I answer that, I, I think uh, I know Shiro had mentioned about some books that uh, e-books that she's sharing. And there's, yeah. one there's one particular book that uh, has helped me so much understand about the American uh, way of life, especially among black children. Yeah. Uh, and there's a, this book called, um, I don't know whether you can see this, um, by Tanahisi Coates. Um, it's called um, Between the World and Me. Mm. It's a black father writing to a son about his experience with racism in the United States. It's a bestseller. Yeah. And I remember my university actually recommended this, required all incoming freshmen to read this and discuss it. And I think it has yeah. helped. Another book, another book that might be of help, I think, is uh, Chimamanda Ngozi's Americana. I'm sure many yeah. people have read that, and I think it's very wonderful. And of course, uh, Ngugu Thiongo's The River Between. Those three books can help us in understanding culture. I feel those books because the question of um, getting to come to the university and choosing careers. Um, I think somebody mentioned that, uh, I think one of the youth, one of the young people mentioned that I think we should allow, the parents should allow the young people to explore, to navigate the world and to be able to explore and to find what passions they have and what are the best things that work for them. And I agree with that. I think it's in, in a sense all that we can do. And I think Rose said this, I think once you get our children to the university, ours, we pay, we help you, we build the foundation, we get you to the university. And the university is a place of exploration. We always have this joke that uh, when the freshmen when we have the freshman class, every freshman that comes to Washington University claims that they are doing, they are pre-med, everybody. But they are not supposed to choose their major until the sophomore year. But by the sophomore year, then uh, you'll find somebody, no, I'm not doing education, I'm doing African-American studies, I'm, I'm doing something else. But the thing is, um, I make that point to, 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 I say that to make this point that, I think as parents, we should allow our children to explore and see what their passions are. If this is our country, unlike in Kenya, where you had to do particular degree courses to be able to make a good living. Here in this country, you could be pursuing anything and you become very good at it and you're the best at, at what you do. I always tell people, um, I'm, 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 I'm a good example, you know? Um, I studied Kiswahili, and when we were in, uh, studying Kiswahili at the University of Nairobi, people were laughing at us. Hey, what do you think you're doing with Kiswahili? Where do you think you go in the world? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we had 10 of us by that particular year. And everybody was doing engineering and others, but I think I was very passionate about Kiswahili, and I loved it. And, and I think I always tell them, you know, it has paved my way. If it wasn't for Kiswahili, I wouldn't be teaching at Washu for the last 20 years. And we have published my books. I would not have done the things I did because I had yeah. a passion for it. But, but the point, the thing is, I think um, the, the great thing that our children have in this country is they have all this broad range, this cafeteria of courses to pick from. And I think once you pick on one that you're very passionate about, when you go to read, you'll not be reading for you not be writing an assignment, you'll not be reading for homework, you'll be reading something that you enjoy. And if you read something that you enjoy, you become very good at it, and you excel at it, and hey, the next thing you find, you're the guru in that particular, particular field. So, um, I know it's challenging for parents, because then we say, well, we are paying all this tuition, and we pay this tuition, and how can you pay this tuition and do African and African? 
African American studies. How is that going to help you? You know, but you know, there, there are so many opportunities out there. You know, even the Googles and uh, the Microsofts and Apple and Tesla and NASA, they don't just need engineers and scientists. They need also people who are good in the humanities, in social sciences. Because when you look at Facebook, it's not just Facebook. You also want to mm. see what's the impact of Facebook on human interaction and all this. You need sociologists, you need anthropologists, you need people to write the language, you know, and so many other things. So uh, th th that's a point I've been making, and I think in some of the forums that uh, Jeff has asked me for, and I've, I've always made this point, you know, uh, let's, let's, let's give them that space. And I think uh, we can guide, but don't let's say you must do this must do this. I've seen students who have been forced, they come sometimes to my office shedding tears, you know. I mean, engineering, these courses are too difficult for me. I can't do it. My parents are just forcing me to do it. And these are American. These are, American. these are Americans, actually. And I can't do it, and I'm not able to do it, and, but my parents will not understand. So let's allow them. Let's give them that leeway. Let's leave, give them the leeway to, to make those choices, and let's trust in them Let's guide them. Let's, if they choose one path, let's be those advocates and shaping the career and trying to show them where this can, can, can guide them. And also the question I think somebody also mentioned about the question I, that I'd mentioned earlier of identity. And it's, it's, um, mm -hmm. and it becomes a big problem of are we Kenyans, are we Americans? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You find, if you look at the American system, and I think the, I'm talking this from experience, um, uh, where my son have gone, uh, elementary and the middle school. The students are fighting so much to language. Yeah, they do an a little bit more relaxing. And I think so you mm. I think you're you're breaking. You're breaking, uh Dictum Tanya. Can you turn off the uh video? Yeah, I thought it's the internet on the side, on my side. Okay. Yeah, I think it's, uh, if it's on, you can turn off the video. It's for clarif. So it should be more clear. Yeah. Okay. Come again, Dr. Motonia. I think we lost him. We have lost him? Yeah, I think we is now, um, I think we kind of lost him. Yeah, I think, uh, Maybe he's he's gonna come back. Yeah. Yeah. We we can continue with this. Yeah, we can just continue, and then uh, he shall be uh, he shall be back. So I wanted us to talk about a little bit more on the careers, and then so that we can give uh, the young people on the clear mind better lives to talk more on the racial injustice. Uh, maybe I I want to hear from the parts of the parents and. Uh, about this issue, mostly from uh, Susan uh, Rose. Uh, how do we keep uh, our children motivated uh, in the selection of the uh, the careers that they need to take? As a parent, uh, do you guide them or do you give them a chance? Um, let me say, like, most of us we as parents, the best thing is to listen. I don't want my kids to do what I'm doing. Being a nurse in America, that does not mean that was my career of choice. I was a teacher in Kenya. And when I came here, I figured out teaching is not my thing in this country. I cannot handle it. I'm used to the Ken thing, which I'll go to jail over here. So, with that being said, when kids go to high school, I do believe we need to start modeling their career minds to start thinking on what do they want to do when they grow up. 
most of them, they start saying things when they were little kids, but as they grow, you hear them, they admire this and this, they admire this person, but what is in their mind? What do they want to do? So in high school, especially the first year, I want to know what do my kids want to do? What is the career path that they are following? That way, in high school, the third year, they start working on their career path. Because if they get to 12th grade without knowing what they want to do, they might waste even their first year of college because they do not have a goal. So to me, kids when they're in high school, they should have a career path of what they want to do. They might not be specific, but we have the business path, we have the health careers, so even if they'll have a bride, a broad base of the line they want to follow, let us give them that chance of exploring the path they want to follow. That helps them in a way, even when they get to college the first year, they start taking classes whereby the classes which are basics for their career path even if they feel they want to change the major, they won't get out of their career path. What I mean is like, you find like in the business industry, the accounting, the first and the second years of college, they do the same classes. So even if your kid was interested in accounting and they feel like, okay, when I get to my second year, it's kind of accounting going to take me too long or it's too hard for me. The classes I've done in my first year are not going to get wasted. The classes I've done in my second year are not going to go to waste. I'll still use them for my third year and my fourth year because the first and the second years are mostly the prerequisite years. But am I going to waste them? But if this kid thinks like they've been in the business parts of the accounting parts, and then all of a sudden they think like they're going to change to health careers, that's going to waste most of the classes they have. So in high school, Let's encourage them to talk about their career paths. It might not be clear, and let us not judge them, to say, I want to be this person. I want to, be, to, to do IT. I want to do business. I want to do accounting. I want to be a nurse. I want to be a doctor. Let's first, when we get that, we get the career path, so that at least we can guide them on the classes to pick so that they don't have to waste some years in college. So, like I said before, it is a family thing to discuss about your, the careers of your kids. It's not them to decide, okay, this is what it is. I'm not going to tell anybody. No, because you need to sit down as a family. Think about it. Do more research and help the kid do more research. But I should not tell my kids, okay, nursing is worldwide. You'll never lose a job as a nurse. So Sally, this is your time you're going to do nursing because you'll never lack a job. No, that's, they're not going to get to health profession because I'm in there. Let them choose and you help them with ideas, with more research. And if there are people who have been in that career path, get close to them, get more information on how to go about it. And some people are so open because they'll tell you, I did this and I messed up somewhere. So if you do this, you might not do like I did. Some people are so open telling you, if you are an APRAS kid, you can take two years of a community college because it will be free for two years. Then after that, you join a four-year university for your rest two years. That one minimizes financial status and that's helpful. Not a lot of people will tell you that, but get to know the people who have gone through these career paths and they can help you out. It's not a must, they all go to a four-year college. An A student kid can benefit from a community college by taking the prerequisite classes for two years before they join the two years of their career path. And that's helpful. I've seen it and some people have said it has been good. So let's allow them to be open even in their education life. We might not know a lot, but even for us, let's do some research from our friends even at work. How are you doing this? Sometimes we tend not to ask because we don't want to be counted in the minor 
area of not knowing, but if I don't know, I don't know, but I wanna know. Because if we keep on saying we don't know, we're not gonna do research, we do research from people who have done it. Like we say, if you have gone through these, I do believe you can take me through some steps, which can be helpful. Not everything I'll take, but guess what? In your 10 minutes of talk with me, I might be helped with some ideas. And that's the best thing I can say, which can help our kids. Let's talk about it, let's it put at the table, see the way forward. And then we think about financial issues because it's a deal about college and career paths. That's great, that's great, that's great. Thank you so much, Ross Jenga. That's a very good information. And uh, I can see that our time is still uh, gone and I wanted us to have this topic uh, because we cannot hide uh, uh, behind the curtain and really assume that we don't know what is going on. I'd like us to talk about this issue of uh, the protest and, and uh, what is happening in the country and as a parent to those um, and Alinora, I would like you to uh, tell us how do you talk to your children or to your youth, or to the youth about the issue, this issue of protest and uh, how to handle themselves now because it is something that is going on uh, in the country. Um, how do you talk to them? Because they are seeing this in the TV every time. And sometimes they might not even, some of them who are young, they might not understand what is going on. They, they, when you talked about the issue of uh, self-identity, they might not understand what is this going on. Uh, how is this guy? Why, why, why did this uh, a policeman kill this guy? And uh, it might be a very difficult topic to handle to a child or to explain to a child. But from a perspective, from a parent perspective, probably you can tell us how uh, you talk to your children, how sh we should talk to the children and the young people about this issue. Uh, before we go to the uh, to the clear minds, better lives, uh, who I wanted the, uh, who I wanted to talk more about this. Uh, can you tell us from the parent perspective how do you talk to the children about the protests going on in the country? Well, I mean, what um, I have been doing since all this came to light is um, encouraging my sons and my daughter to have that conversation with us. Let's get into their head to see how, as young people, they are feeling. Actually, both our two sons, my uh, 27 years old stepson and Richard, who is 22, because they've had their own experiences. And it's important that uh, we are able to help them walk through the, all the emotions that they are feeling right now. Because you don't just want your child to feel angry and have it all shoved up inside. There must be a positive way of expressing how we feel and making ourselves known. Uh, is there a civil right? Uh, protest is good. Peaceful protest is good. So I encourage as many young people that can get involved to do so, but to do so safely. You don't want to be out there when it's dark and there's chaos and agitators. Um, it's also important that we begin to get involved in forums like this so that we can begin to strategize what do we do when all the cameras are gone? What do we do when all the protesters go home? So those conversations for young people must be had. We must encourage them to get involved. We must encourage them to use their voice. When they uh, are treated unfairly, like I was telling my daughter yesterday, I said, you know, it starts from school. When you go back to school and as a 12 years old, somebody may shove you or they may speak to you in a way that you really didn't like. It's not you retaliating, no, shut up, you shut up. What you can say is that, you know, use your voice. I don't appreciate you talking to me like that. That's where it starts. And then it goes from there to where you are getting involved in student um, organizations at your school and then on and on. Um, it's important also that as young people and for young boys, let us learn to work with our African-American brothers and sisters. Because sometimes their ways are not our ways because we are impacted by our African culture. So we maybe are a bit more scared of our teachers because mama is gonna to go to school and start speaking that African accent and they don't wanna be embarrassed. And maybe we have a different view on education than they do. 
it doesn't make them lesser than us. We must begin to work hand in hand with them, understanding that what affects them affects us. And we must support the Black Lives moves, Movement because we are all in this together. And sometimes young people may have, you know, we, they have energy and very idealistic, but put it in perspective. Our young boys, don't forget that we live in a society where it, it, it just takes for one mugshot and life is gone forever. So be careful, be careful of uh, Me Too movement. They are out there. I know when we had this discussion a few years, I mean, a few months ago about the Me Too, trying to encourage our young black boys to navigate relationship. A lot of them said, you know, I'm even scared now of like, I don't even want to date anymore because you, you know, anything is, hey, Me Too, Me Too. But <laughs> parents don't want them to get married. They want them to give us some grandchildren. So those conversations are important. Those educations are important. And we must make sure that we continue uh, to engage in this manner and empower our youth. And they know that we are here for them. Uh, the church is here for them. Nintendo for Africa is here for them. Parents are here for them. Their mentors, their teachers are here for them and use all those resources to make your voice known and make an impact in this country. Because America is still a good, good place to be. Mm -hmm. and we Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Nora. Thank you. That's so important uh, because uh, it's what is happening and we have to inspire them the right way. Uh, Joe presented is saying, we appreciate the migrant professionals in the community for the good support and mentoring yeah, your youth, our youth and parents. Encourage your kids to be involved in mentorship and youth leadership programs at school and in the community. And thank you so much for what you are doing. We really appreciate you. Uh, so thank you. I would like us now to go to Shiro uh, in her group. And I would like Shiro to tell us, um, Shiro, are you there? Yeah, we're here. Thank you. Now, uh, Shiro, I want, to, I want now to give you this opportunity and tell us now, uh, clear minds and better lives. You young people, you have, uh, you have now the experience of uh, what is going on. And uh, you've been talking to young people. Last time when you were here, in the, in the last forum that we had, uh, you really talked about the issue that is going on. And it is as if you had already seen, you, you, it's as if that you, you had a foresight of what, is going to or what was going to happen. And really appreciate that. Now, uh, what is your take on racial injustice in the U.S. and how do you handle racism and discrimination at work and school? I want you now to have this now uh, from the perspective of uh, clear minds and better lives. Three of you. Um, okay, thank you. Um, thank you for um, giving us the opportunity to talk about this. Um, as Bo Washeri and I talk about this, we ask that you drop any questions you have for us. Um, that way we can answer them as we continue to have this conversation. Um, I, I, do, I don't think the question about how I handle racism, I actually don't think I have an answer to that because I think there's a lot of anger that spurs up. I've worked in places where I've only been the black person um, mm -hmm. in those work areas. And I think Shadi and Bowa will agree with me. It's at times you feel like you had you have to work twice as hard or thrice as hard because of the skin you know because of your skin color. Um, but there is one thing I will I, I will talk about, and I, I think it's something that we as a culture, I guess the African culture, tend to lean towards whenever we move to this country, um, and it's it's a perspective or perception that you know we should separate ourselves from African Americans because sometimes we feel like we're the better blacks if I may say um, and authors do use those words sometimes we feel like you know we we work harder than them um, you know we talk more appropriately than them there are all the stereotypes that we've navigated um, but then Recently, um, my sister, Bo, and a group of friends of, of ours, we started a book club and um, we've really gotten to understand the Black American perspective 
and also try to understand how we fit into that picture. And like I said earlier, at the end of the day, we're still black, irrespective of um, of our background, which is the Kenyan background. But I, I do want to say that for me, I think there's a lot of unlearning we have to do as a community. And that begins with us not saying, to understand racism, you have to unlearn the aspect of what you've been told about the uh, Black American community. That way you can understand how race itself plays towards yourself. Um, and a couple of things would be probably, you know, um, unlearning how we perceive them, um, unlearning that we, we are one instead of always navigating towards that perspective that you know we're Africans and we're not we're not African Americans because like um, I think Dr. Mutanya was saying earlier like the kids that you have or Joffrey was saying like the kids who are born here they're always going to consider themselves African American so I think with the climate that's going on right now I think as Kenyans or um, as black people because we're black we have to be in with the movement of Black Lives Matter because it could be one of our brothers, it could be one of your sons, it could be one of your friends. I mean, it could happen to anyone. We, we personally know guys in our lives who get stopped by cops just for being in white people's neighborhoods. We know guys who get stopped just because of their skin color. Um, personally, we know, we know them and it, and when something like George Floyd happened, I think for me, I went straight into like worry mode for someone like Boba or like any other male, figure, even my own father, like you just worry because you do not know if that's going to be the next person because of their skin color. So I think like I was even emphasizing earlier, it is so crucial and important and vital that we actually do understand the history of this country you know when we move here there, there is that perspective of like you know we're told what to think and things of that nature but i think it's upon ourselves to educate ourselves and learn what racism is because it just doesn't affect the black african community black american community it affects even the african community um at a large and i'll just leave it there while i let the others talk um yeah so I think for me, it was a little late when I started to like engage with with the Black community outside of the Kenyan community. I think it was after Michael Brown had passed away um, and there were all these riots. And so <clears throat> I took it upon myself to raise awareness and to learn like what is going on in the Black community. Um, now, the higher up you go, in, in, in terms of profession, the less of your color that you see. And so one thing I, I noticed about myself was that even though you are um, competent in the job that you are in, sometimes you lack that confidence and you don't even know that it's, um, it's called imposter syndrome. So um, there's this thing where when you're amongst a lot of uh, white people, who are educated sometimes you feel less than and sometimes you may feel that you don't deserve to be at that table but it's really how it's because of you've internalized all those racial stereotypes and um, you have to unlearn them and so if you're not confident in those spaces because you are essentially the only black person sometimes you feel like you have to represent everyone whether it's sometimes it's unconscious so you don't even know that you're doing it and you find yourself overcompensating for things and sometimes you're like i don't know if i if i can say that if i'm confident enough to to say that if it would be received the same way as like my white counterpart and so um one thing i would say is really being confident in yourself is way is one way you'll find is one way you'll navigate the spaces because if you're not confident in yourself and who you are, it's really hard for you, someone to dwarf you, to reduce you to that stereotype they already perceive black people as. And because for some of us, we, we've lost that accent. So when we speak, we don't get maybe the preferential treatment of like we're African, like maybe our parents can get away with. 
they'll see us as black. Maybe the thing that ties us to our Kenyan identity is our name, but when they see us, is they'll see us as black people. And so we have to be confident in ourselves, but also advocate for yourself. You're your biggest advocate and advocate for your people in the spaces. Um, one thing that I found myself doing was, you know, asking about representation. It's important for you to like bring the, those kind of conversations up. And I think right now is the best time because right now Black Lives Matter is like, you know, the top thing. If your company or your institution isn't issuing a statement saying that they're sub in support of the Black Lives Matter, they're kind of under fire. So right now is like the perfect time to ask, you know, your um, like, your colleagues or your supervisor um, to also like, you know, hire more people who are diverse like you so that, you know, you kind of feel that comfortability. Um, it's kind of like, um, you know, when you go somewhere and then you see another like Kenyan, you go into a new place and then you find another Kenyan, you get excited because you share something, right? You share either like that, that Kenyan background. It's the same thing in this top places where it's like, because sometimes you fear that if you speak up, you know, what might ha happen to you. But when white people speak up, there's a lot of confidence. And even some of the things they say, it doesn't make sense, but they're very confident in what they're saying. So not only do you need to be competent in the spaces, but you also have to be confident in, confident in yourself in order to tackle racism. Because if you don't, it will, it will begin to affect you um and your mental health and then um yeah that that's what i would say how, how would you say they need to get to the confidence part is it i mean it's a are? working progress i think if for me i think if if i'm a for a parent is you need to start building that in your child at a young age you need to you know affirm them and assure them of themselves when they ask questions allow them to be inquisitive allow them to um, to ask you those hard questions because when you tell them like no you know when you kind of dismiss them like the parent someone said earlier it's like you know you're not helping them build confidence in themselves they're not going to find their voice they need to find the power in their own voice because this society is an individualistic society it is not a collective like back home where you know people even like in their job places they're afraid of their boss like you've ever gone to a like bank back home and then they're like if mukuba is not here i can't do anything you know and here it's like speak up you are your own best advocate and that they really promote and encourage speaking up so if we bring that culture of not speaking up and um being quiet is a form of respect when they get out into the world they're not going to really thrive, especially here, because people appreciate people speaking up um, and they even rewarded for it. So I would say for me, because it was, it was kind of late, it's always a work in progress. You, you know, it's, you have to, aff I have to affirm myself and assure myself that I have the skills and the ability to do this job equally and that my voice is my own power. But if, if for the parents who are on here, you, it's, it's important to build those skills in a child at an early age, you know, like let them explore themselves, um, teach them that their voice is, is their greatest tool and it's their power. Um, but that's how you'll build confidence. And then when they get to like 18, you know, they're confident in who they are, who in they're confident in themselves. And when they get into the spaces, it's hard for, for, for people to tell them who they are and, or it's hard for them to, question themselves if i may say so i would say really instilling that at a young age is is the the key for for some of us if that isn't there it's it's a work in progress you know it's like the older you get learning new skills is harder mm -hmm. so but for the people who have young kids you know just building that confidence in your children affirming them assuring them allowing them to be inquisitive ask questions um, and not necessarily diminishing them or dismissing them um, and giving them that space uh, respectfully, obviously, you know, they, they have to be respectful, but it will really help them tackle a lot of problems when they get out into the world.
Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's a very good information. In fact, you have really answered the question by Arinova Solanke had written, how can we help young people? Please educate us. I think that could be a bit of information that have really helped us. And I, I, I really concur with you, with what you're saying. And uh, somebody by the name Stephen Magua is saying, first thing, um, the first thing at this excellent young ladies are saying, research and find out what racism is, especially uh, from the historical perspective of black Americans. And, uh, and uh, it is, okay, what she say, he says, uh, research and find out what racism is, especially from the historical perspective of black Americans. And I believe this is going to help you to understand what is racism. And, uh, Mugai Mutonya, Dr. Mugai is saying, uh, yeah, I just wanted to wrap up on. I think when I was trying to finish that thought, I disconnected, and uh, I like what um, uh, the speakers are talking about, especially our youth, especially the fact of speaking up and giving our children the confidence. Uh, I think it's a critical thing because, unlike in Kenya, where you speak up and you know they, they just slap your mouth or you just get punished or in class or something like that. We need to build that confidence and I think it works in great ways on that. And beyond just uh, building the confidence and giving them the voice, I also would argue that we should also instill in them a lot more of our culture. Because once you get to the university, I see this from in the university, the university like, likes diversity and students who can talk about, not about America, but at least also from where they come from, they have an edge. And I think they embrace them, professors embrace them. There are also a lot of opportunities for them to grow in questions of diversity, the clubs and a lot of that. I think it helps a lot. So let's still talk to them about our culture, our family histories. I think it's a very good thing. It's a, also a way of building confidence in them, knowing that you come from a great family and what the grand, their grandfathers and uncles and aunts and other great people in our families did. I think it's a sense of just also building confidence on them. Uh, so multiculturalism, identity, you can be African, you can be American, you can be so many things. You can have several identities. It, it's actually, it, it, it's a good thing. It's a rich thing to be multicultural. So it, we don't have to struggle with either are we Kenyan or American. We can be everything, we can be Kenyan, we can be American, we can be Africans, we can be Kikuyu, we can be Luo, we can be Maasai. All those are identities and I, I think it's a great thing and we can, we, we're able to navigate that. Finally, about black boys, um, I always mention this and I talk to my sons about, and I think we should always be talking about questions of race and especially when they're getting out and they're driving out at night. I always tell my son, when you're out there driving in the predominantly white neighborhoods, watch your speed, you know, don't over speed. And if you are st stopped by the police, um, just be cooperative, don't argue back. And I think these are necessary talks. These are necessary talks that we have to talk to our children in order for them to survive. It, it, it's a world that we can't escape such kind of thoughts. And I think it's always good to bring these quite kinds of issues out there yeah, in open for them to, uh, to know. And finally, um, Vitendo, you, you've been doing a, a lot of great things. I think most of the things that you've been talking about, Jeff has been doing this. The mentoring, you know, uh, giving the students, our children, the voice. I remember we had a forum here about presentations the other week, and we had even kids as young as five years old making PowerPoint presentations. I think we should encourage a lot of that. And Jeff and Vitendo, we want to just tip our hats for you for the great thing you continue to do, including these kinds of forums. I think they, they do a great, wonderful thing. So. I think I'll have to run and I just wanted to say thank you and uh, great work for all that you're doing and appreciate it. Uh, Boa, did you have anything you wanted to add on to that? Um, I feel like you guys said everything that uh, was there to be said, but I think I'll just echo your sentiments that uh, we cannot separate ourselves from, uh, I guess, the African-American experience because us, the ones who are growing up here and the generations that will follow after, they're gonna be, they, we are viewed and we're taken as African-Americans. And actually something interesting, um, 
as I've dug more and more into our own history, you realize uh, you get to learn more about how the African American struggle and sort of like the African uh, struggle and fight for independence, they intertwined in a lot of our um, revolutionaries while also collaborating with African Americans. So there's a lot of history that's connected there. And it's important for us to not dismiss or ignore the conversation of racism and understand that it's something that also affects our generation and future generations of uh, Africans who are growing up here. Thank you so much. Uh, Shiro, if you don't have any questions, uh, I would like to thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Hiram. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, thank you so much, Eleonora. Uh, 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 thank you, Ross. Thank you, everyone, for being here for this purpose because, in fact, we have really enjoyed, we have really learned from you. And I would like to open this session. In fact, we don't, uh, it's almost eight. It's almost eight, and I wanted uh, to give you, uh, to give others the opportunities to ask some open questions. And uh, so if you have a question, please, you can just uh, post the question or you can just, uh, Jeff can help us to moderate that section. Jeff? Brian, do you have something? Yeah. Uh, Dennis, Dennis. Yeah. yeah, I think you can give, uh, uh, if Dennis had something to say, that's awesome. But uh, yeah. yeah, give a few minutes for people to say, add something yeah. to ask question. That would be awesome. Yeah. I think Dennis, Dennis, you're welcome. Oh, uh, I didn't have anything to say, but I, I think uh, what we've learned here, I think it's, uh, I've learned a lot as well, like also to be more like, com like passive with my parents, talking more about how I feel and, you know, not hiding what, uh, <clears throat> what I feel inside, and, you know, to be, I feel like, I feel, I see a change coming in like our community with the way that this discussion went. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, if you have any questions, please, uh, this is an opportunity for you. Can I ask the young people here, are they engaging with their Black American uh, friends at school? Because recently we went out to protest, uh, Nintendo of Africa organized a protest and uh, when I shared the post on Facebook, my son reshared it and uh, he had the sharing my mom's post as a Nigerian immigrant to the United States. My place in this country would not be possible without the generations of African Americans who have protested, marched, fought and died for my civil rights. Their fight is our African immigrant fight. So I'm asking the young people here, have you been contacted, uh, contacting your friends at school or those of you, our young adults who are, who have friends at work, who are black Americans, are we talking to them and trying to show our support in that way? Yeah, um, so I actually have um, my friends from high school. Um, we talk all the time, we talk about um the racial bias that goes on so this is it's usually an ongoing conversation um because i and and my sister and i also went to protest on monday too because it's so important for us to understand that like your son said that the ones who protested before had before us paved the way for us you know um because essentially if we were back in the 60s in the 60s and we migrated here, they would probably segregate us as well. So because of our skin color. Um, and so it, engaging in that dialogue with them helps me to understand them more, but it also helps me to understand um, myself and the role that I play um, as a black person. So I don't try to m make my, I, do, I don't try to, I guess, alienate myself or make myself feel like I'm different from them because I think the fight is ours collectively. Um, but it's more so 
um, understanding it so I can also take on that mantle for myself and fight for them and fight, well essentially fight for us in those spaces that we don't have any space because me breaking that barrier um, in whatever field that, that I may be in it will also then open the door for other people like me because again when it comes to like that's been said multiple times they only see color and so it isn't about the language it's only about the color so once we realize we really aren't that different from them um it's just that they can't trace the ancestry line we can and we can we've been able to preserve the culture as well as um know where we come from then we can see that really we're fighting for the same things and we're also fighting for our legacy and our generation as well so if that makes sense yes, it does. And, yes it does. And, and and to add on to that i think um because i also have african-american friends too and and it's 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 even after the protest goes or before the protest began we're always having these conversations because I think they they get racially profiled more than I even do. Mm -hmm. So it's like kind of like a thread where we talk about like how that racism incident went, but it's highly important what Shetty is saying. It's like when you lis listen to them and you listen to their stories, you get to understand why they behave the way they do. You get to understand why the system is against them. And that's why we're, we're saying read the books um, that 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 um that we've recommended for you guys to read between the world and me is such a great book um thanks dr motonya for recommending that book um there's also another book that we read called prisons are obsolete right that's the title yeah and it really talks about the systematic racism that african americans have to go through but when you have those conversations i think it makes you reflect on yourself inwardly and you change your perception of this people that you've had for a long time the one that you when you come here in the states and you're just like oh like i'm actually a better because i know where i come from and all these things and we're also living in a climate whereby african-americans are now beginning to go back home to understand their roots they may not know what country they came from but they they are now doing events yearly whereby they like go back to africa go back to whatever our country when I invest in Africa, travel to Africa. Um, and I think if we're the ones who live here in this country as, you know, Africans who know their roots, we can be the one to also push them to be like, hey, like, you know, want to come, come with us. I know friends of mine who really want to come to Africa just to understand like what it is there. And, you know, even me, like sometimes I talk to them about how neocolonialism was a huge factor for our struggle, especially like in African countries where we had to fight for um, independence and they get to understand, like Bogo was saying, it's like, we're not that much different. The only difference is that your ancestors were brought here as slaves, but we were slaves in our own home when the white people dominated um, Africa. So again, it's all about educating yourself, history, history, like just, just taking that choice and um, from a parental figure yeah like i would also like encourage the parents on here like let your let your kids have african-american friends it's it's it, it's needed for them to also understand what's going on because as a parent you may not fully understand but your child having people not just you know friends with white people also having fr friends of their own color is highly important to them because a part of their themselves is not lost um and also another thing i also I've I've had like some of my American friends, my white American friends also like call me and text me and ask me if I'm okay. It's I'm trying not to be able to eliminate um the thought that there may be also like white people who want to also learn about this. So I think it, it it's it's a a tricky line like do are we the ones to educate them about our history? But for those who are willing to talk to us about our history, um becoming open to oh okay okay you want to find out what black lives matter is about and things like that so that's kind of my two cents on that yeah absolutely I I, yeah oh, I just add on something that um 
that I've seen actually is that even Black Lives Matter protest is inspiring Black people across the globe to also demand equal rights from their own government. Mm -hmm. And so this racism issue isn't just an American issue. It's a global issue. It's a, it's, it's a public health crisis. So we're not just experiencing racism in the United States, but we're also experiencing racism when we go to Europe mm -hmm. and other parts of the world. So I think it's also showing us that, that Black people collectively, we're in this together and we need to join in on the fight and demand what is rightfully ours that we've been robbed for centuries after centuries. Um, and I, I don't know if you know this, but there's also wage inequality where I, where black people are pay, paid less than white people. Uh, you're not gonna know that because I mean, I don't know if you're gonna go ask your coworker, hey, how much money do you make? they're probably not going to tell you that but there's that wage inequality that we have that's put in place so it's not just fighting them fighting for their lives they're also fighting for the african immigrants who are coming here and taking these occupations and saying we demand equal rights across the board economically politically um and the healthcare we demand what has been stolen from us for for generations just because of the color of our skin which we all which we share that with them yeah, I think Sherry touched on this, and it's kind of like what I was going to go with my thought. It's realizing that this is beyond just like the shooting the police. There's like different layers to this. And the more we learn about this, the better we are equipped to dealing with situations where uh, we're racially profiled. And this times, even once you get into like corporate life, I know that there, there's different things, there's different ways that you as a black man, you have to move around these spaces compared to your white, white counterparts. And what we're, what the movement is pushing for is for equal rights to where I don't have to do twice the amount of work as my white counterpart to, you know, be viewed the same. Um, so it's important for us to kind of like, I guess, learn more about this. And and just to add on to what Chedi and Bo was saying, I think, it's also like we have to highly understand we cannot sit on the sidelines. We cannot say that this does not affect me personally, so I'm not going to speak about it. I'm not going to do anything, but guess what? Your child is affected by this. They're going to go to schools. They're going to interact with people. They're going to interact with white America. Uh, and, and you know, now that we're talking about it being a global issue, it's it's even back in Africa. Um, today, Nigeria stood up against racism, you know, um, even within the country today there was so much talk going on about how they need to fight for police brutality because we know even in kenya we know we know we see how police treat people back in our own country mm -hmm. you know so it's not it's not just about um color it's also about the injustices that happen in our own home country the injustices that are happening worldwide and and like Shadi saying if you go to other countries and <laughs> if you go to other countries you will be racially profiled i was recently in the united kingdom and i was racially profiled i never expected that to happen but it happened and i think we also have to what side of history do we want to be on do we want to be the people who sat down at sidelines or the people who actually spoke and did something about it so I mean, if I may also add, one of the uh, my takeaways from this forum is what Joe uh, uh, said, that we have to unlearn some of the biases that um, that we ourselves as African carry in our hearts um, against the Black Americans. And sometimes it's difficult. I remember when I came to this country, I was told that um, by some of my colleagues that, oh, it's okay for you immigrants and you're taking our opportunities and blah, blah, blah. And to me, it's like, do you think those immigration papers were cheap? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like, you know, we, we, I said, look, uh, for 10,000 people who go for this visa application in Nigeria and pay the fees and do all, all the paperwork, only a small percentage actually giving visas. That money is not refunded back. It goes into the American economy. So we have to learn to be patient with them. And sometimes some of those stereotypes, they, they are coming from facts, uh, people's experiences. 
but in spite of, we, we must learn to work with them and bear with them because they have a whole history of why they behave like that. And we don't know all the backstories, all the challenges they've experienced. So let's bear with our Black American brothers and sisters. And you may hear things that would upset you and turn your stomach. Uh, my son introduced President Obama when he visited New Chicago years back. And one of the newspapers in Chicago raised a stink about why use an African to introduce President Obama when they are like Black Americans mm. in the University of Chicago. Um, you know, what do we do with that information? Just, hey, that's, that's what it is. But just, just keep doing your best and make sure that you represent Black people and Black youth and not see yourself as just a Nigerian American, but you know, um, putting out an image that will help build our community as black people. So let's just bear that in mind and make sure that some of the things that we have to unlearn so we can move forward, let's do it. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Pastor Steve Agua. And uh, I think that I also want to weigh in uh, first of all, just as a pastor and also as a father who has, you know, many teenagers. Uh, I think that uh, it is important that, that we, even as Africans, but also especially as Christians, that we take the time to actually understand this problem. Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you, even just from a pastoral point of view, if Jesus had been born in our time, mm -hmm. he would be very, 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 very conversant with why and how and the root of the problem. Because, uh, and I'm not going to preach, but just kind of to give you an example, in the lifetime of Jesus, he knew what was going on with the lepers. He knew what was going on with the prostitute women. He knew what was going on with the Samaritans. If you look at all the groups of people that Jesus Christ was always hanging up, uh, hanging, hanging around, were the oppressed people, were the people who were being downtrodden. And so sometimes, uh, as Africans, and especially as uh, African Christians, when we come to America, because we already are educated and we are kind of in the middle class, we don't even connect with uh, you know, the African-Americans because mostly they are in the downtrodden group. And like some of you have been expressing, we even have a sense that, hey, we are better than them. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and so we even actually join the system of oppressing them. Mm -hmm. We actually join in the system because we look down on them and they know it. Because, you know, you all know that I work amongst the African-American community a lot downtown. And sometimes when you're just, you know, drinking tea with them or so, they'll tell you, why do you guys hate us? Why, why do you guys think we are, we, are, we are inferior to you? You guys think you are better than us? Now, where did they get that idea? Because we communicate just in the same way. Why do the Black Lives Matter, the Blacks, why do they say white people hate us? White people oppress us? Well, because it was communicated over and over and over until they knew that's what you think about us. And so, uh, and, and I think, first of all, it's unchristian. And not I think, I know it's unchristian, first of all, even to have uh, a superiority complex over, any, in, over anyone. And we know that this is not uh, something that we have developed here. Even when we go back to our own countries, we have uh, tribalism. We have uh, some way that we feel about certain tribes. There's some, some of us that feel we are more superior than other tribes. So now we, when we come here, we find somebody that we can that is below us. So uh, one of the ways uh, that, uh, you know, apart from just connecting with them and working amongst them and truly listening to them, one of the ways to quickly learn what is really going on, uh, if you're not a book reader, is use TED Talks. TED Talks are very excellent because they're usually like, you know, 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, but somebody will have done some really good research and they will present you, they'll, they'll, like for instance, you want to understand what is institutional racism. You want to understand what, uh, uh, what is, how uh, racism is, let's say, manifested in, in, in the, the voter ID issue, gentrification. Because you need to understand those things because like uh, I think it was called, she's called Shiro, what they were saying is this. We, we who are first generation Americans, or we who are immigrant Americans, we might not feel it so much but our children and our children's children down the line, they will, they will be treated exactly as the African-American is treated here. And even African-Americans will tell you, even the ones who are most educated and they live in very good neighborhoods, still they get profiled, still 
they, they, they find that uh, they, they, they are being discriminated against. So we cannot afford to sit on the sidelines. We cannot afford to say, this is not my problem. Because, uh, and I'm, I'm going to summarize, as a Christian, it is our problem. We are supposed to, to seek out the justice for the oppressed. But on the second level, we are Africans. We are black people. And these are, these are our people. And so I think that we have a, a clear mandate that we have to join in in the fight and educate ourselves and find solutions and, and be a part of the solution rather than just be spectators. Thank you. Well, that is powerful. Thank you, Pastor Magwe. I really, really appreciate uh, your input on that. And I think also sharing, I, I really appreciate your great work that you do in the, in the African community. Uh, and, and I think uh, this topic, uh, we can go over and over and over. And, and I'm sure uh, we almost, it's almost 8.20, 8.30, heading 8.30. But I, I feel like we, I'm going to, this one going to mess us a little bit here. So. Okay. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for uh, everyone who has uh, been able to share the, the speakers of today. I, I really appreciate your great inputs and great information that you've been able to share. And also uh, our great uh, moderator, uh, Bona Jared with Arise TV. Uh, there is something that people have just shared about I mean, and we talk about racism. Uh, we, we've talked about it, this one, different forums. And, and, and the biggest concern that comes into our mind is that, yes, like Pastor Magua said, we always think that uh, it's them. Racism, discrimination is all about them, but uh, not us. Um, and, and those who have kids, uh, I've always uh, thought that in the next few years, or the kids who are growing up here, our kids who are growing up here, they don't have accent. And, and actually, they are more align themselves a lot with the, uh, with the with the black American. But when it comes to discrimination, definitely uh, it, 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 it hits them very hard. Uh, but there are things that we can do. I've always said that there is. When you think about it, I took a class on leadership class in St. Louis, focused leadership class in St. Louis. It took us like 400 years back, on the history of St. Louis. Uh, where how we got here where, where we are right now and one of the things that i've always said that when i went through that i said i wish i can be able to bring that information i put to every immigrant that i know in st louis because you will be able to see uh life in a different way you'll be able to understand st louis the african uh black americans in st louis in a different way i i, I was guilty because of that kind of a perception of maybe blaming them for maybe the way they react and the way they respond to the situation. But until you go through that, you will un you see a different way. And like, uh, I like what uh, uh, Pastor Mag was saying. And, uh, take time and go listen to those uh, TED Talks. Very informative. I've been listening to them since I think this is happening. And I've, I've, I've gained a lot of information. If I was to share somebody that I'm sure they're going to block me because of all the things that I've been able to listen. The other thing that I shared the other day was uh, Just Mercy. It's a movie that is, uh, it was supposed to be rented, but now it's available for free just because of what's happening around the country. Uh, and I've watched it with my kids and you listen to it, you really feel like, you really get boiling when you listen to see how things are, but that's a reality. That's what's happening, happening on the ground. Uh, but we cannot just sit down and complain. I say, when you listen and see what's happening, let's just encourage our people to go and vote. I feel so bad because I know a lot of people have become US citizens, but they don't also go and vote because they think their vote doesn't count. Uh, they don't have time for that. It doesn't take time. It's, if it, the most you can take time is in maybe 10 minutes if you're there, there's no big line. Second, uh, we have people who are participating in elections. Like now we have one guy who is participating in uh, uh, Secretary of State. He's a Nigerian, a great friend, great. I mean, when you listen to him, he's a great guy. Uh, they always ask for people to go and vote, go and uh, help in uh, educating people, voter registration, lobbying. They do that. We have our young people who are very, I see the great team that we have here. 
and I see the re- I don't see the reason why we can have a team that comes and say this is the team that is going to be very uh, involved in uh, reaching out to the African community, the immigrant community, to help in voter registration. I- I'm glad to hear that Ferguson, they were able to get their uh, a mayor, mm-hmm. uh, a lady who was elected from the African community. But you can see the movement that is coming up, and you will be able to see by the next by the election that is coming up in the end of the year. You can see that movement coming out. The question that I've always asked, where will we be as, as immigrants? Are we going to be part of that or are we going to just wait and see things happen? But uh, let's, let's see how we can be able to get ourselves involved because uh, if we don't create uh, and, and develop those systems, if you're able to run for the school board, that's, where, that's a great place. If you're a city council, you're able to do it. Uh, I've been told you I need to grant, but I don't think I'm a politician, but I've made some impact in different ways. <laughs> but I would say if somebody has, uh, somebody has shown interest, let's just rally, out, rally behind them and support them. If it's our young people, they have, they have great interest in, 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 in public policies and all that. Uh, I think we've taken kids White House. We, we were organizing to go to Jefferson City when the, 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 everything's get to normal. So that if there are people who have their interest, we're able to nurture them very early. And in the next five, six years, when they are, think of running for any parliament and for any electoral position, at least they have, we have cleared the path. So uh, let, let's see how we can be able to build each other and, 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 uh, and uh, at the same time connect with our African, with our African Americans. Uh, because we, we, we cannot fight the war when we say them and us. We're all together. And when the discrimination comes in, when you're stopped by the police, and, 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 and uh, the police who has, because I say we are not every, not every, not every police, police is bad. And at the same time, not every police is good. So if you're, if you're unfortunately one of our son or, or you or you, you are stopped by police and you did do that, small mistake, then uh, you're a black person, you are equally on the same radar like any other black person. And I think we can be able to change that. Uh, the, I, I have done also involved a forum where I'm able, I've invited police to come and talk to uh, the youth. We have gone to our, for, uh, our Florissant police a couple of sessions. We have session with the police. Uh, we have a situation where our youth raise money to support our, our police who was injured in Hazelwood. It's us building those relationships and we want to get everybody to participate so we can be able to build a good relationship with uh, law enforcement officers, but at the same time also in the city council. I think I've, I was I was in the city of Florida for six years in the uh, environmental quality, quality commission, which I just volunteered and I, 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 I served there as a, as a, as a commissioner. And, and, and every time I see, when I, I, I meet mayors, they always ask, do we, we need more people to serve in the law enforcement. We need people to serve in the commission. Uh, but if we are not participating, then, then they will not be able to know that we exist in, in some of these uh, places. So I would encourage people to, if you have a time and you're able to do that, serve. If you want to uh, vie for a school board and you're thinking about, let me know, I will be able to connect you and we can be able to get something done. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, put your name out. Uh, but I think uh, it's a great discussion. We can do a lot, um, educate each other on this. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Dr. Mutonya, for such a great information. Uh, all the youth, the youth who are involved in the discussion today, I think it was very helpful. Yes. Uh, let's see how we can build each other. If you have questions, you can always do them even after the discussion. All right. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Gerard, if there's no any other person or anything else, we can actually uh, call it a day. Where, yeah. where, where do you watch? Where do you watch TV? Uh, that's a Rice TV. A Rice TV is, uh, is a YouTube channel. The YouTube, okay. Yeah, and we usually focus on issues which are going on with society. So we, when we have uh, some recordings, we just put them in our channel, and then we share the link. You can just go look for Rice TV, GTV on the YouTube, 
and you can be able to watch us there. Great, wonderful. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, in the near future, we are coming up with the programs. We are coming up with the programs. So we shall be, we shall be uh, trying to uh, educate the society and involve the community. We have been trying to come up with a streamline the procedure on doing that, and uh, we shall let you know about that. All right, I'll get in touch. All right, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We really appreciate for each and every one of you. God bless you so much and have a good day. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Uh, on, uh, on, on June, on June, 9, June, 12, June 18, we have what's called Building Momentum Speaker Series. It's going to be a Zoom meeting. Uh, and we always invite uh, our, uh, our community, people from African community to share their life experiences as immigrants as a way to educate the audience, which we invite Americans and uh, immigrants to just listen our experiences as an immigrant, as immigrants, and what we're doing in the economic development of our region. So we invite you, we're gonna be able to see a link coming up on June the, 12th, the 18th. It's gonna be a Thursday at six, and uh, uh, we, you can always ship in, because that's a great way now we have a platform to educate uh the lives of immigrants and what we're doing as opposed to what people think about immigrants coming in to take away resources that helps to create a to to educate them that we are not actually coming to take resources but actually says we're coming to add value and, and create jobs and do other stuff uh, and also people can ask questions because most of the time people listen what the media talks about but they don't have information from directly from the host's mouth and that's why we do that so if you have when if you're able to come, that's good. If you have friends who are Americans, we ask you to invite them, then they can be able to learn from that. Otherwise, thank you everybody. All right, thanks to the moderator, thanks to our panel, fellow panelists, Rose and uh, Rinola, and our great youth, the uh, Shiro, and everybody else and the participants. Thank you so much. Right, thank, you. thank you. Thank you.